Well, good morning. It is good to be with you guys this morning. Today I'm wrapping up nine days on the road traveling across the South Coastal District. Over the last nine days, this will be the 10th church that I've connected with during that time. We have about 35 churches in 43 locations across uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. And we're excited about what God has been doing and continues to do across those campuses and across those churches. Um, I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the reports from our last district conference. Two in particular. The first is this, is that in those 35 churches last year, there were 1,879 people who said yes to giving their life to Jesus. 1,879 people whose lives have been transformed because of the witness of God in those churches. In addition to that, there were 890 people who have been baptized in those 35 churches across the last year. And those continue to happen, both the salvations and baptisms since this summer. We're excited. God is, uh, is multiplying our efforts. He's taking the seeds that we plant. He's taking that small basket of fish and loaves and multiplying it to meet needs and make things happen, and we're excited about it. We're excited about uh, a couple of church plants that are happening in January, end of January. We have a church in Atlanta called Awaken Atlanta that will be going uh, public with its Sunday morning services. They've been gathering folks, having events, and getting connected. It's been an exciting time. And then in February, we're scheduled to have a church in Columbus called the Foundry Launch. And, uh, and then we're working with a young couple in McIntosh, Alabama. If you've never heard of McIntosh, Alabama, that's okay. I'd never heard of it either. It's about 45 minutes north of Mobile, um, and these couple had some roots and connections there, and they've moved in to build community and start to gather folks toward planting a church in that type of community. Now, rural church planting is a little different. <laughs> urban, super urban church planting is a little different than it happens anywhere else. It happens a little slower, but we're excited to see them get involved and really be missionaries in that community. God is doing remarkable things. We've had churches in this season that have restart. We have uh, churches that have been, over the course of this time, revitalizing and transforming and seeing great new things happen over the last few years. And so um, you're a part of that. You're a part of what's happening in those churches, and they are a part of what's happening here. And when I go there, I get to tell them about New Beginnings Church and what's happening here. And so we're, we're excited to be in this together. There's this great camaraderie and trust among our churches, and it is a great, great season. Um, like they said, uh, not like Wes said, but uh, I'm not Tim Scott, but Tim Fox. And <laughs> it is good to be with you. Um, my wife is Anita, beautiful, remarkable redhead, um, who her and my two kids are back in the Atlanta area. Uh, they were working in school this week. Sometimes they get to travel with me, sometimes they don't. We have uh, a son who is a senior in high school and is in the midst and swing of college applications and figuring out his path and doing all of the lasts that come with this year, and we're excited for him and what God is doing in his life and as he is seeking out God's direction for what's next. And then we have a daughter, Sophia, who is a sophomore in high school, and um, right now she is in the swing of theater. They just finished competitions for one act and Mary Poppins and her have auditions this week for a play called Big Fish. It's a, it's a really just a fun story. If you haven't seen it, there's a movie, Big Fish, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. And so we're excited for her and for them. And, and that's why I don't travel a lot on the weekends, right? Like I do these trips where I'll take a tour of our south churches in the fall and our north short churches in the spring. I do the south churches in the fall, so it's not 110 with 99% humidity, Although there were some days that were pretty close to 90 this week down this way. Um, but it is, um, I, I have that priority, right? Like I have three years left with uh, 
kids who live in our house, at least for this stint, I imagine there'll be one, at least one that comes back after college. But uh, in this phase, I've only got a few more years. And I've got hopefully 20 or 30 years to be doing this. And um, so one is much more rare, which makes it much more precious. And it gets the greater priority. So I don't travel every weekend, but we stay connected through huddles and with our pastors and connecting with our churches. And so um, I, I always count it a privilege when I get to be here. And thank uh, thank your pastor for sharing, the, giving me the opportunity to share with you guys a little bit uh, from the word today. Today, uh, it'll be more, if it's all right, just kind of more of a talk. And pri- so just super practical more so than sermon, if that's all right. Um, we're going to, even if it's not all right, that's what it is, because that's what I prepared for today. So you can not like it and go home and listen to a better preacher online. Uh, <laughs> we're going to pray and then jump in. Father, you're good, and you're faithful, and wonderful, and you have indeed heard us as we have prayed through this week. You have heard us in these moments today. You have inspired and encouraged and directed our paths, and God, we're just so grateful. And today, we ask that you would speak to us through your word and guide us and shape us, that our lives might reflect your love and your glory and your power more and more each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, We'll be in verse 24 in just a moment. Just a little context. This is the end of Jesus' longest sermon. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. And as he's wrapping up this sermon, these are the words that he says to the people who are listening. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. A couple of things stand out in this passage. It kind of sets things up for us today. Is The first is this, that no matter how you build your house, how you build your life, no matter whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, there are going to be storms. You don't get to opt out of the storms in life. There are, there are times when the waters rise and the winds blow and the rains pour. Being where you're located, you've experienced those kind of storms. But you've certainly experienced them in your life as well. And I don't know if it's just coincidence. I imagine it is that there are three things listed. But it feels to me like life storms always come in threes. It's probably just coincidence, it has nothing to do with anything, but the reality is that whether we're following Jesus or not, we're going to have those storms. We're going to have those times and those seasons where the water rises, right? Like the water rises, the rains come, the winds blow, and everything feels like it could fall apart. And you've been in one of those storms and you've heard that wind whistle through the trees. You've heard the trees creaking as it sounds like they're going to break or maybe even come crashing down, and the, the fear that can be welled up in us in those moments, the anxiety, the, the worry the, that comes with the storms. And yet, Jesus describes a way of living, a way of building our lives that would allow us to live unshakable. He, he's telling us that there is a way to build our lives that is built on such a strong foundation that the waters, when they rise, they can't wash it away. That when the rains come, they can't destroy it. The winds won't knock it down. I've seen the power of some of these storms. I come from North Carolina. Before here, grew up in North Carolina. Was in western North Carolina just before the storms hit. 
have friends who have homes along rivers that were just gone when those waters rose. And I imagine, what would it take for that to be an unshakable place? What would it really take for us to build a life that's unshakable? When those storms come, when the waters rise, the winds blow, we have a tendency in that moment to start praying. <laughs> Even if we haven't prayed or prepared ahead of time, we start praying. Life gets hard and we start praying. We start praying that God will rescue us, that God will make us strong, that God will do this or that to make it so our life doesn't get shaken up or broken apart in this storm. The funny thing is, or maybe not so funny thing, is that he is telling us there's a way to live and build your life and prepare for the storm so that it's unshakable. There's things we can do, things we have to do that are much more practical <laughs> and yet very spiritual because they're based on the words of Jesus. There are things that we have to do ahead of time to be ready for the storm that are as important or more important to building an unshakable life than praying in the moment. If we wait until the moment, it's probably too late. We're in recovery mode. So what does it look like to build our life in a way that's unshakable? I think there are lots of different things that Jesus teaches us to do this, but we're going to just get into four because I was told you only like hour-long sermons and I don't want to go any longer than that today. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So if you are in, your, in the Bible still and you still have it open there to chapter 7, if you just go back to the chapter before, in verse 25 of chapter 6, it says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, it's not life more than food and body more than clothes. And then verse 34, therefore don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Um, I don't know about you, but telling me don't worry doesn't help me a whole lot. <laughs> Like, don't worry probably leads to more worry. I figure if somebody tells me first, don't worry, they're about to tell me something I need to worry about. And yet he's telling us, don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you need. Don't worry about how you're going to provide for yourself. Don't worry. I want to tell you, in my 40s, I'm still in my 40s, but in my 40s, been diagnosed uh, with anxiety, depression, and ADHD. I don't know if you know what all that means, but here's what it means in my day-to-day -day life. It means that I can, almost like a superpower, learn new things really fast if I'm interested in them. It also means if I'm not interested, it doesn't matter how much time I have, I'm not going to be able to do it. It means uh, that I can get about 12 hours of work done in four hours if I'm focused enough. But if you interrupt me in that four hours, I might accidentally rip your head off. My brain is just different. And so it does some of these things. But here's some of the things that it does that made this passage so difficult for me over time. It has this ability to like pull up memories from 10 minutes or 10 years or 30 years ago and then spiral in worry and beating myself up for how I responded or did something 20 years ago that I could. And it, and it happens when I'm trying to rest. <laughs> or... Or it'll like send me into the future and I begin to imagine every possible pathway forward and worry and stress and spiral about what's going to happen next. And I can get lost in that. And then that can bring me down and send me into a pit that I can't even figure out what goes on. 
Then there are times where the chemicals in my brain just go through a quick change and my mood drops and everything is a problem. Or I'm a problem for everyone. One or the other. Unfortunately, usually the second. In fact, I got it diagnosed not for me, but for everybody who has to live and work with me. <laughs> so that we can figure out how to do this better. But all of that meant that passages like this, I just didn't even know how to process. Like, what do you mean don't worry? My brain that you built, God, goes there. So what am I supposed to do with this? And so I want to share some of the things that God has taught me that have helped me. The first is that I've learned to discipline myself to live in the present. And that we have to discipline ourselves to live in the present if we're going to overcome our tendencies to worry. Here's what I mean. The past is a great place to visit and a terrible place to live. We need to be able to visit our past to remember moments like what we sang about when we prayed and God heard and he answered and he provided. We need to go back to the past to remember the lessons we've learned from both our successes and our failures. But if our past is defining us instead of helping us, then we're stuck. Our past is not meant to define us. Those failures in the past don't define us as a failure. Those successes in the past don't define us as a success. In fact, we are neither defined by failures or successes. We are defined by a relationship to Christ. We are defined there. So no matter what happens, whether we fail or succeed, we can do whatever he's asking us to do in the present. Now that's what we have to do. We have to go back to the past, visit, be reminded of how God has been faithful, all that he's brought us from, all that he's done, and then we come back and face our challenges with the confidence that we found by visiting the past. But if we're stuck there, we're not able to actually be here. We're not able to act here in the present, focus here in the present, enjoy here in the present. Too many times churches can get stuck living in the past. We remember what it was like when, and because this isn't like that, we don't like this. That's because we're stuck in the past, living somewhere else. But equally, the future's a great place to visit and a terrible place to live. I have this tendency more than that tendency. Part of that's the ADHD. It like drives me for new things, new adventures. I get bored easily, all those kind of stuff. And so I have a tendency to go into the future and imagine all that could be, good or bad. When I'm focused and healthy, like it's all that's good, all that's possible, and I'm dreaming and envisioning. But if all I'm doing is dreaming and envisioning and it's not connected to any action right now, nothing changes. I'm living in this future, wishing I had that and being disappointed with what I have now. So I have to go, we have to go and visit the future, see what's possible. I mean, Acts chapter 2 tells us he, he's going to put dreams and visions into our minds and hearts for what he has for us and for his church and the world. We're meant to have those dreams, those visions, to think those thoughts about what's possible in the future. And then come back and let that influence how we act and live here. So I had to learn that right now there are things in this stage, in this place, in this moment in life that are wonderful and terrible. And when I move into the next stage, whatever that is, many of those things will change. Some of the terrible things will become the great things and some of the great things will go away. And if I don't learn to enjoy this moment as the gift it is from God, as the only place he's really given me to live, then I miss out on all that he is giving me right now. So what do I do? I have to practice this. Like just a couple of things that have helped me to actually 
do this, to just visit the past and come back, visit the future, come back, but to live right here. There are two simple things that really help me discipline myself to live in the present when I'm getting lost. The first comes from Philippians chapter 4. You don't have to turn there. They may or may not be keeping up with me on the screens. I didn't give them these, so, you know, not on them. So, twenty-nine, verse 29. I'm, I'm sorry, not verse 29. I'm in Ephesians, so that's not going to help us anyway. Nah, it's more fun this way. This forces them either to listen or read. It's all good. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And then we can skip down to verse 8 because I didn't mean to read verse 4. Uh, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. So when I'm getting lost in the future or the past, I have a tendency not to think about such things. So I get a journal or a piece of paper or a notebook, and I'll do about a week at a time, and I'll take seven pages, and on, the, on the, each page I'll write out the words on the left side, um, true noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. And before I go to bed, I take five minutes and I reflect on that day. And I identify one thing from that day that matches that description for each of those words. So I'm thinking about in today, in the present, what is true and noble and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy and so on. Then, then the morning when I get up, I say out loud or I write down 10 things that I'm grateful for. Because I found that gratitude and anxiety can't inhabit the same mind for very long. One will push out the other. Because anxiety is about what we don't have. It's about fear. It's about insecurity. It's about disappointment. So when we focus in on what we're grateful for, it overcomes that anxiety. And so for me, these are just very practical ways to discipline myself to live in the present. Because I know that I can get stuck in the past or the future and miss out on what's happening now. I've had to do this just to give you an example. Right now, I told you my son is a senior. He'll be headed off to college in um, nine months. Uh, I don't think about nine months very often. I'll think about it for about five minutes and then come back to right now. Because otherwise, I would be overcome by the emotions and the thoughts of what will or might or could happen. Whether he goes to school 45 minutes away or 10 hours away. I have no control over those things. I can't do anything about them now. And there's no need on taking on tomorrow's emotions right now. So I have to discipline myself to enjoy every moment of right now. Another one is my daughter is 15. Um, <laughs> enough said. No, actually, I have loved the teenage years. Our kids have made life wonderful most days. Most days. Not all. I'm not going to pretend that's true. Um, but I realized something when my son, about six months after my son turned 16, I didn't know how much I would miss car rides with my kids. You see, they, they, those are the times when we had some of the best conversations. There's something about not having to actually look at each other that gets them to open up in the car. It would be moments after the school day or practice or whatever it was, it would just get into those conversations. Moments after youth group or church and we'd be talking. And those went away when he turned 16. So I told my daughter, I felt like God asked me to tell my daughter this. When she told in this 15th year, I was like, between now and the time you turn 16, if you need me to drive you anywhere, the answer is yes. I just tell you now. Now she was taking advantage of this a little bit. But even when she does, I win. 
I win. Because we'll sit down in the car, and within two minutes, she starts talking, and I don't say another word until we get wherever we're going to. At home, she's in her room with the door as close to closed without being closed as possible, doing as little talking to us as she can. <laughs> she's in her recovery mode. <laughs> and I get it. She's introverted like I am. But I've just had to learn some ways to look for ways and, and things I can do to discipline myself to be right now and enjoy right now. The future will come, good, bad. Past is gone, good, bad. All I have is this moment. And when I'm disciplined in this moment, worry doesn't overcome me and cause my life to shake in the problems. Right? God's been faithful. I can trust that. I can trust the things that he's taught me to do that have made the foundation sure when the storm comes. And it can help me not to worry. So a couple of more of these. Uh, that one I kind of lean into a little bit much because it's it sets everything up, doesn't it? Like how much different life is when we really learn to be present in the moment with the people around us. So the second is to never stop learning. Never stop learning. In John chapter 8, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, it says that when we abide in him, we are his disciples, and the truth is in us, and the truth will set us free. Learner is another word for disciple. So when we abide in him, we become a learner, and then the truth fills us, and truth sets us free. Many times we live bound because the truth is not in us and we've stopped learning and abiding in him. We, learn, we stop learning, the truth stops setting us free. We live in fear and doubt and trying to control and our life becomes rigid. And when the wind blows, we break instead of flex. And so he's inviting in this, into this relationship with him and with each other and with creation and our communities of constant learning. Walking with him and continually learning. We have to, this is, this is maybe hard, this probably is not as much a problem for you as it is for me, but I think I'm right all the time. And I bet you probably do too, because I'm going to assume that you wouldn't hold a wrong opinion on purpose. If you thought you were wrong about something, you'd change your mind, which means you think you're right about everything. Now, here's what I know. For me, that's not possible. I'm wrong, I don't know, 20 to 40% of the time. I just don't know which 20 or 40% of the time it is. Which means two things. I need to be humble and I need to keep learning. I need to keep learning God, who God is, about God, in a relationship with God. I need him to continually be revealing more of who he is to me. I need to be walking with him in a way that I'm learning so that his truth fills me more and more and sets me free. I need to be curious and learning about my wife every day, every week, every year. She'll be growing closer, learning more, understanding more as she's growing, as she's changing, as life is happening. Am I curious about her? Am I learning about her? Am I learning in the church? Am I learning the word? Am I allowing it to abide in me? Am I allowing myself to learn more about the world that he's created around us? Am I open to new thoughts? Am I open to God showing me something new? Am I open to changing my mind? In fact, I've always been confused about, and the election's over now so I can talk about it. Um, I've always been confused when people say, get upset with a politician who changed their mind. I'm more disappointed in a politician who does the same thing for 40 years and never changes his mind. Which means he didn't learn anything in 40 years. I don't think the same way I did 20 years ago. I sure hope they don't either. 
And I want to be around people who are learning and growing and changing their mind, developing and open to new, open to God teaching them something new, open to God revealing more about himself and his word and his world. We should be learning more about his church and how we live and work and operate together, more about our community around us so that we can better engage with them in the gospel in a way that will reach them today, not just in the ways that reached them in the past. He's inviting us into this relationship of continually learning. One of the strange things is that few of us take the time to learn ourselves. Like to learn about ourselves. (laughs) To know who we are. To know what we really care about. What we really enjoy. How he really made us. And you see, once we take the time to learn who we are, we can take that and offer that to the world as a gift to bring about glory to God. You see, he prepared good works ahead of time for us to do, but we don't know why they are because we don't know ourselves and what he made us to do. And he invites us into this journey of even learning and discovering who he made us to be. Parents, that's part of our joy with our kids is to help them discover how God made them. That passage that parents like to quote of, of, of from the Proverbs of raise a child the way he should go and he will not depart from his old is not about teaching them God's ways. It's about helping them discover how God made them. And when we help each other to discover more of how God made us, what we love, what he put in us, what our passion, how our brains work and how weird those things are, then we can begin to engage that and use that for the good of the kingdom and the good of the world around us. So there's something about this learning more and more of who we are so that truth can set us free. So the truth can set us free. Joe, you know, just random, kind of random, also connected. It only takes, research has shown that it only takes really enjoying, loving 20% of your job to be completely fulfilled in it. If in your job you do one thing a day that you really love, you'll love your job. That's all it takes. And sometimes we need to do the work to learn what we love in our job, or to learn that maybe we need a different job (laughs) so that we can learn to love it. Pulling on those red threads of, of what we love over time and defining it more and more clearly. So like, uh, example would be someone who says, well, I love to, I love to teach. Okay, well, great. That's pretty broad. Let's get more specific. What do you love to teach? How do you love to teach it? Does it matter who's in the room? How many people? Does it matter the shape, the size, the room? Does it matter the age of the people? Does it matter when you start to define more clearly what it is you love to teach and about teaching, you can lean into doing that more and more for the good of others. So there's a piece of this that that the more we learn, the more we learn God, the more we learn ourselves, the more we learn our spouses, our children, our communities, our churches, the more unshakable our life is because the truth is setting us more and more free. And is that a five-minute warning for me? Yeah, okay, good. I I mean, I told you I had an hour, right? Like, uh, number three. Um, This is the least obeyed commandment among Christians. (laughs) Establish biblical rhythms of rest and work. Establish biblical rhythms of rest and work. Mark chapter 2 verse 21 says, Jesus says to us, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We got to really go back to Genesis to even get an understanding of this because It clicked for me when I realized that Scripture actually teaches us to work from rest, not for rest. To work from rest, not for rest. Which, by the way, it still says five minutes, so that hadn't sit down at all. I'm still good. I won't go extra long, I promise. Genesis tells us 
God created everything in six days, and then on the seventh, he rested from his work. Now, if we spend much time or even do a quick reading of Genesis, we see that humanity was created on the sixth day, right? God worked, and then he rested. He didn't, it says he rested from his work. He didn't need rest, right? Like, he wasn't tired. He did that for us. But the remarkable thing that I hadn't noticed before was that that day of rest came on humanity's first day, not seventh day. And that it was a gift, the Sabbath is made for man, it's a gift for humanity to be able to rest and then work. They had been given an assignment, have dominion, develop the garden, develop creation, partner with God as his imagers in ruling over creation. But only do it for six days a week and only do it after you've rested first. I said, well, they hadn't done anything. What are they resting from? No, no, no. They're resting for. They're resting to remember that they're not really in charge. They're resting to remember they're not really in control. Resting to remember that, yes, he's put us in authority over, but that ultimately he is the authority. And we can trust him. Busyness will make your life shakable. It will make it flimsy and weak. Because you weren't designed by your creator for busyness. You were designed for a rhythm of rest and then work. Rest and then work. In fact, in our culture today, we have a tendency to think, I work so that I can get my weekend or my day of rest or whatever. And then we even fill that day with stuff if we don't fill it with work. We don't know how to rest. We don't know how to stop. We don't even sleep seven, eight hours a night. Our bodies were not designed to go at the pace we put them into. And then we wonder why life gets frazzled. Difficult, why our tempers get short, <laughs> why our emotions are on edge. He said, Well, you're running at a pace I didn't design you to run. You're operating in a way I didn't design you to operate. If you would follow my patterns of rest, then work, sleep, then work, you would find a stability and a strength that you didn't even know you had. Do you know there's one thing that your doctor can prescribe that will lower your chance of heart disease by 50%? One thing, and it's not a medication. It's a nap three times a week. In any case, the only thing that will do that, a 30-minute to two-hour nap three times a week will lower your chance of heart disease by at least 50%. You're like, yeah, I still ain't doing that. We get, we take a nap and somebody calls us, wakes us up, and we sound kind of groggy. They're like, did I wake you up? Oh, no, no. I wasn't sleeping. I was, I was just busy with it. I was resting my eyes. I was, you know. Like, there's something about this command that's so difficult for us. And I think it goes back to the identity question. I think if our identity is in what we produce, what we create, how good we are at this, that, or the other, then we've got to keep proving ourselves. And the beauty of being given rest first is that you have nothing to prove. He gives you rest. And it means we stop. We stop whether the work is done or not. Because you know what? They'll still be there the day after you rest. And if you didn't get it done, maybe you didn't need to get it done. And if you think, if I don't do it, nobody else will, then we got a whole other set of problems and probably doesn't need to get done at all. Last thing, steward your gifts. Steward your gifts. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, I'm not going to read or quote them. You don't need to try to put them up on the screen. But it is the story of Jesus telling the the parable of the talents where one person is given five bags of gold, one given three, and one given one. And and each one uh, is then responsible to steward it. And the first doubles their money, the second doubles their money. And the third buries it and then returns it to the owner. 
And it's really strange. Jesus' words are like, you wicked servant. Not lazy, not what were you thinking, not ignorant, not that was not smart. You wicked servant. You didn't steward what I gave you. You didn't use it the way I intended. You got afraid, and so you stepped back and you hid it. And the reality is that every one of us have been given gifts and things to do, good works prepared ahead of time to do, and he invites us to do them, to invest that he has given us, to steward our gifts. Now, here's the problem. I noticed that Jesus often said something along the lines of only doing what the Father asked me to do. I'm only, this not the Father's time. I'm only doing it here now. And I thought, well, I'm trying to do what the Father's asking me to do, but I'm trying to do 10, 12, 14, 87 other things too. I'm doing lots of things the Father didn't ask me to do. And I realized by doing that, I am... I am not doing the things he did ask me to do nearly as well as I could. I'm hiding from them. And in fact, I'm also taking things that he had for other people to do and doing them myself. As a leader, especially, we are, we are called to steward our gifts to do the things he's asked us to do and then help others do what God's asked them to do, not just do it all. It's a thing that we're in this together. In fact, when we see Moses and his father-in-law Jethro, Moses is, he is giving judgments for all the people of God. And this is a funny thing that I didn't realize either, is Jethro said, you're wearing yourself out, but you're also exhausting the people by doing all the things that you shouldn't be doing. So in fact, not only do we exhaust ourselves when we're taking on all of these things that he didn't ask us to do, we're exhausting other people too. So instead, we steward the gifts. Do what he's asking us to do. It's connected back to learning and resting and living in the present. And all tied together, these are some of the ways that God uses to help us build an unshakable life. Some of the teachings of Jesus that if we were to hear them and put them into practice, we build our lives on a foundation that's unshakable. Let's pray. Father, you are good, your word is good, your word is true, and your word is helpful. God, as we have heard the teachings of your son Jesus, would they speak to us, challenge us, invite us? God, would you help each one of us today as we heard these things, maybe speak one, one that you would have us really lean into in the next couple of months. One that you would have us dive into and learn or practice. For the one who's overcome by worry, would you show them a way of peace? God, for the, for the one who needs rest, God, would you help them see that you have given it to them if only they would receive that gift? God, help us to keep learning, growing, and using the things that you've given us for your glory, your purpose, your kingdom, and your name. We ask this according to your love and your power. Amen. Amen. Pastor Steve.